Hello, everybody. This is Juan Carlos Brando. Thank you for having me today, and thank you for having Ms. Wong uh, with this uh, new show, this live Q&A show that we usually have every Thursday at 12.30 uh, at noon. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. If you want to share this Facebook Live, please feel free to do it, or you can also uh, go to our YouTube channel, and you can watch this live video. You can also ask questions, send your questions. And Ms. Wong, I'm sure she will be really happy to give you an answer regarding to your case. So please don't forget that uh, the phone number that we have available for this show is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. And also you can just call that phone number, make your appointment, uh, get in touch with the attorneys in the law firm, with the attorney Margaret W. Wong. And thank you so much, Ms. Wong, for having us today. How are you doing? I'm very good, and thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Wong. Uh, well, as you know, I'm right now in California. So for oh, me, it's still the sweet. morning. I just had breakfast a few minutes ago. Uh, but yeah, California is one of those states that are... Uh, very, very into immigration, just like California, Texas, Arizona, because so many people come in through California or through uh, through Texas, through Arizona. So what is particular about this state? We know you used to have a, uh, an office here in the city of Los Angeles, but I understand why you, you had to uh, maybe not continue with this office because the traveling distance is really, really big. It's like five hours, five or six hours flight. But um, what is the most interesting thing that you could say about California regarding to immigration? Right. California have uh, San Francisco is totally different from Los Angeles. Uh, the immigration court in San Francisco it's uh, more liberal than the one in Los Angeles, um, but the immigration office, I think, is uh, San Francisco is also a little bit faster than Los Angeles. Our office used to be in Los Angeles, but then th there was no, from Cleveland to Los Angeles, I think going there, there was a direct flight, but coming back, we have to change flight so that the flight time is really, really long. And it's just interesting because Actually, I love Los Angeles. It's a beautiful place, you know, the beach and stuff. But it took me, after we get to Los Angeles, it takes more than one and a half hours one way to go to our office. Because I like to travel just for the day because of family and, you know, next day we have to work. So you know, sometimes we have to take the midnight flight back and we don't get in until like six, seven o'clock in the morning to Cleveland. And then you have to wait like one, one and a half hours or two hours in a, in a, um, waiting airport, normally Chicago. It's just a, uh, also it's strange because anytime like you uh, advertise um, or anytime you go to court, people ask for your bar license. Anywhere else um, in America, we I work in all 50 states. Anywhere, they don't ask. If you say you're a lawyer, they believe you're a lawyer. In Los Angeles, a lot of times, I think it's because so many people come and they're lawyers from so many countries that they want to see your bar license. And because I'm a member of different bars like New York, Ohio, Michigan, uh, I have a lot of bars because we have a lot of offices. So a lot of times, I have to give them all my license and then they'll say, oh, okay, I got it. But, um, and also in the, when you advertise, they want to know, they put on the advertise, especially in the Chinese newspapers, they, because I speak fluent Chinese, they also want not only your barcode, but all the states that you're licensed in. And for me, it's a lot, you know, because uh, we'll do federal work. Aside from the state bar, we also need to uh, belong to different circuit, like nine, uh, Nine circuits, California, Alaska, uh, Washington. Um, it's a big, big circuit. So it's 
so finally I said, I just couldn't hack it. We still have a lot of clients in California, but I just stopped that travel because we have younger lawyers who travel. But after a while, though, we just get very tired, you know. But California is just, but the court in California through the years are becoming stricter. The green card is also very slow because there's so many people there. The asylum interview is very, very, very slow. Um, it's not even like uh, Ohio, even New York, uh, Chicago. These are bigger cities. Atlanta, you can make an info pass appointment in Los Angeles. I mean, forget it. You know, you're, it's like a godsend just to get an info pass appointment. Um, it's very slow and the fraud is very high. So in Los Angeles, every time I sometimes I go, I mean, sometimes a lot of times I go for interviews to help clients and stuff. You just wait for hours. When by the time you walk in, the officer left. It's just a difficult place, I think, to practice. And lawyers, there, there's so many lawyers. It's hard to tell who is who, I think, it, you know, because all lawyers, because of market, uh, information. Most of them do everything. In most other states or cities, you have a group of lawyers who does litigation, a group of lawyers who does family base, a group of lawyers who does employment base, a group of lawyers who does or the uh, American embassy practice, you know. So it, it's a very different place to practice. That's why the immigration judges, they're this sort of tough, you know, but I don't blame them though, because it's, it's just weird. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Wong. It's always interesting to uh, to understand what what's going on with the immigration, what is going on with the office as well, uh, because some people just don't know what's going on. And yeah, right now I understand that the, uh, traveling to Los Angeles is not or traveling to California is not a, uh, an easy thing to do very often. So um, yeah, thank you for sharing your thoughts, your knowledge. And let's start with some of the questions that we are receiving from our audience. Um, the first one is, my daughter has a student visa. Is there a way that me and her dad can go on a student visa as well? or just travel with her since she is 17 to take care of her. She got it for five years. Okay, so your family must be sort of wealthy. To get a student visa, you need to have her attend a high school, private school, because public schools don't issue J1s or F1s. So your daughter has a student visa, so she's on F1 since the age of 17. And I understand your situation because you want to go with your wife to spend time with your daughter. So now you probably have student visa, uh, tourist visa, you come three and a half months, four and a half months, then you leave, then you come back. So most of um, our friends, what they do is the, the child is here on a student visa, the mother come five and a half months, four and a half months and leave, stay there for six months. The father come three and a half months, six and a half months and leave, then the mother comes. That's how most, especially if they specialize, like we, in Cleveland, we have a big, um, uh, Cleveland Institute of Art, Cleveland Institute of Music. Uh, we have a big music academy. So most of the kids who go there, they're sort of genius in music. So, and that's a good question. I don't know if you're from China because China is a problem because they, you know, it is tough to get any visas nowadays. But absolutely, you could, uh, one of you can come as a student visa, the other one can come as F2. Um, then you can stay here and just pay the tuition and go to school and be here instead of three months you leave, six months you leave. You could do that if they grant it. Sometimes they may get mad at us. So they cancel your tourist visa and they won't grant you a student visa. So now you're stuck with not being able to come. Another advice I got, I've been doing this like 45 years, for long, actually about 50 years now because I'm getting old. But uh, I've seen a lot of, like from Hong Kong, I came from Hong Kong in 1969. So I see a lot of those young people who came because their parents are wealthy. And also in Hong Kong in those days, in China in those days, um, especially after the 90s, all the rich people, um, they all send their children to America because it's, you know, it's glamorous. It's like, oh, my child is studying in this prep school in, in, in New York, in California, in Boston. Now, if you get into those awesome prep schools, tuition is about 60 some thousand. They all go to the Harvards, the Yales. That's great. Um, but if they only come 
just to stay with a relative, maybe go to a public school or private school. As a mother and as a grandmother, my advice is think about it because I don't know if it's such a great idea because I've seen kids, you know, in the 60s who came as a kid, you not know, 12, 13 years old, came alone or in the 80s or 90s. So now they're all growing older. It's hard because I really believe in, I mean, unless you're orphan, if you have parents, I mean, why send them away so far, you know? especially you have to work so hard to pay the American dollars tuition. The other problem, more than money issue, is a lot of times I really think children needs the love of a parent, at least one of you, to be next to them, to give them your values, your culture is not just going to America, especially if you can afford that tuition. I would just spend the money on private tutoring, stay back in Hong Kong and China, wherever you're from, because ultimately, and that's, that's why I'm glad I came when I was 19 years old. I brought a little sister who was 18. I already know who I am. I know I'm Chinese. I know I'm not white. I know I have to fight my immigration journey. I know my father worked very, actually I didn't, my father didn't have money so I got off of scholarship. I know my parents are anti-communists. I know my parents only want us to be the best. And I know my parents love me enough to send me to America, even though as an American grandmother, I don't know if I would like to see my grandchildren go like to China now without parents. So my advice is think carefully because I don't know if you want to send your teenager, America today is not the America you watch TV. A lot of problems with teenagers. 85% of our teenage kids, they have depression issue, they have cutting, a lot of them are self, you know, they need mental health care. It's just a lot of problems in America now. So I would think carefully. I really think if they want to go to college, that's excellent. But I don't think kids should come elite unless, you know, it's extreme poverty. I mean, I'm not saying no, but I'm just think about it. Because now I look at all the a, a lot of these kids because I represent them. And now I'm older. All these kids who came there, I'm 72. So most of them are already in their 50s, 60s, 40s. And I really look at who they became. A lot of them still don't speak English or have English. A lot of them still, you know, maybe illegal, maybe legal. Um, a lot of them, they really didn't become what their parents' vision of them want to become. And I, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. Actually, I won my case yesterday. I won my bond. So I'm so yes. excited. But um, think about sending kids to America unless it's just to work because we're so poor. Because going to school, especially you can afford it. I mean, and I'm glad I'm raised with my parents because by the time I came to America, I know exactly what they want me to become, what I should be, what I could be, and I don't want to disappoint my country people on who I became. Yes, Ms. Wong, thank you so much for this advice because I, I, I remember I spoke to a Mexican lady a long time ago, about three, four years ago maybe, and uh, she was telling me that she is from Guadalajara, Mexico. And she mentioned that she left her daughter in Mexico with her family. And I, I asked her why. And she said, because here I need to work all day long. And I don't know what my daughter is doing. I cannot check up on her. I cannot be... Uh, sharing time or I, I don't have much time to to supervise her so there back in mexico i have uh, my mom uh, which is her grandma her aunties her uh, family and i can support mm -hmm. her financially from here and pay her college so after she gets the college graduation she can come and I was thinking, this lady is cleaning hotel rooms and doing that uh, is heavy stuff. Uh, but somehow I understood her point because we don't not, we don't want our kids to do whatever they want. And meanwhile, we are working; they are doing some stuff that we don't know. Maybe doing drugs, or uh, you have seen many cases of young people that missed their DACA. A benefit or uh, there some kind of benefit because they were doing drugs. So uh, I totally understand and I agree with 
your point, Ms. Wong, and thank you so much for sharing it and for giving your advice. If you have any other questions, please give us a, uh, a call. The phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. Uh, Tasha is asking, uh, is it okay to have two uh, I-485 case no. with USCIS, same petitioner? Okay. This is probably, you are talking about uh, 245. So we have clients who have an EB3. So you want to do, EB, instead of downgrading the EB2, EB3 to EB1, you want to have 245. Oh, I'm married an American citizen. I want to have 145. My employer filed for me. I want to have another one. No, you can only have 145. And the sad thing is immigration is not very careful. So sometimes if you have 245, you write them a letter with a receipt telling them to cancel one. They made a mistake and cancel another one. That's why I would not even file it because I've done cases like that. Um, and it's, by the time you cancel one, it's just a pain unless you want to file it without, with a work permit. But you could have gotten a work permit free anyway. Now C9 is all free now for two years. So I would absolutely not file another one. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Wong. Yeah, this person is saying that uh, maybe they are going to close one application so that uh, they don't have any problems with USCIS. If you don't know how to do this, please give us a call. The phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. <laughs> know it's a job to advertise, but it's really easy. You can just write a letter and make sure you attach yellow out, clear it out, the circle out your receipt number. Because sometimes... You know, those people, because they have like, uh, even though you have two receipt number, because it's the same name, same date of birth, same place of birth, and probably same A number, they may cancel the wrong one. So when they do a letter to you, sometimes they forgot, but most of the time they do. You need to make sure, check that case number with the cancellation number to make sure it's the same one, because we have a lot of clients, they also, they don't read, you know, so they say, oh, it's canceled. And now they cancel the wrong one. So by the time you get the, Green card is the wrong green card number. So if you file a 45 under asylum, a 45 under marriage, you want that marriage case. You don't want asylum because green card under asylum, you cannot go home until you become a citizen. So these are little things that make sure you pay attention. But it's not that difficult. Yeah, thank you so much. Ms. Well, Sorry. Is that it? Uh, it's my family petition. My, law, my lawyer refiled uh, because the other is taking too long. Ah. I would have done a transfer with the receipt number of that visa petition. That's okay. It's okay. You just wasted another $1,225 because each green card is $12,025. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Wong. Don't forget the phone number is 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984. This person is asking the following. Hi, Mrs. Wong. I received my letter of approval for my green card, but still don't have the card. Can I travel abroad and wait until I receive my green card? I uh, have an emergency. I would not travel. If you have an emergency, make an immediate info pass. Uh, they'll stamp their passport. Then you can travel. But look at your approval notice. I think the new approval notice does allow you to travel because the card is taking longer. Read the approval notice, but make an info pass appointment, bring your passport in, and they'll stamp your passport with that 551 temporary stamp for one year. Thank you so much, Ms. Wong. And by the way, congratulations on that uh, hearing yesterday. I know you were nervous, uh, but you will never forget what you learned so well it's like riding bicycles you will never um you will never forget about how to ride a bicycle maybe you lose some uh abilities uh, but you will never lose it because being a, a lawyer is is not just um it's not just a title it it becomes part of your life you 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 become an attorney in every way of your life, in every single side of your life, you become an attorney. It, it goes inside of you. So that explains. And if I feel like that, that I, I've been an attorney just for 16 years already, um, I can imagine 45 years working as an attorney, uh, working on the immigration field. Uh, Thank you so much. The phone number is 216-279-3984, 216 269 
eight four. Um, Ms. Wong, uh, I have been waiting for my green card for three years. Do I need to pay for my C9 work permit? You don't need to pay. Uh, one thing nice about C9 work permit is that they increased the fee actually in July uh, 2007 and then August of 2008. And then through the years, now they're increasing. There was a time when I got my green card, it was like maybe $30, $40. Now it's $1,225. You never, never have to pay for extension of C9. Now the C9 is good for two years. If you could get a parole, it's also, I just got another one of those double uh, cards for two years of parole and two years of work permit. I thought it's weird because normally they'll give you two years of C9 and one year of work permit. So um, you don't have to pay. Everything is free. Once you pay the first time, twelve twenty-five. Okay, this person is saying that um, that she didn't pay the twelve twenty five, um, the twelve uh, one thousand two hundred twenty five dollars, as she is a widow, and a non profit organization is helping her. But she needs to know if she needs to pay for the four hundred and ten dollars. So yeah, as long as it's a C nine, you may have gotten a fee waiver. Uh, then you attach the fee waiver. I don't, I've don't. i never done fee waivers. That means that you don't have to pay because of low income. Uh, I don't think you need to pay C9 debt. I don't know. But I don't think you should pay because um, if the uh, 45, whatever the receipt on the 45, you attach that receipt. I would file it and don't pay. If they need to pay, in three or four days, they reject your filing and say you need to pay and then pay it. I don't think you need to pay. Okay, thank you so much. Don't forget that the attorney Margaret W. Wong has been traveling across the country for several years, helping people in nine cities of the United States, in Atlanta, Chicago, Cleveland, uh, Columbus, Memphis, Minneapolis, New York, Nashville, and Raleigh, North Carolina. And the phone number is 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984. That's the phone number uh, you need to call. Um, we have an interesting question coming through our YouTube channel. We are almost reaching 2K uh, subscribers on our YouTube channel. So wow. uh, this is uh, really successful. TPS Nepal is valid till December 2022. If it's renewed, when it uh, when is the best time to apply for advanced parole? And can I apply with renewal or wait till it's renewal approval first? Thank you. Uh, lately, it's automatic uh, extension. A lot of countries like El Salvador. Um, so I would find it now because it's not, you already have one to uh, August. Oh, now it's already August. Oops. Uh, if you have to apply for renewal, you could also together apply for parole. You don't have to wait uh, for the approval. But sometimes it's automatic. So you could find it now and attach the automatic because they know it's automatic. But if you want to be sure, you could file together with the with the filing of the renewal of the TPS. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Wong. And this is a very good answer. So Gautam, if you want to call the office 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. Is it very difficult to, to file the advance parole as well? No, it's very easy. That's why you don't really need a lawyer. You, you go to the USCIS.gov, you print out the I-131. I think parole you could also e-file because they change every day what you could e-file, what you cannot e-file. I don't like e-file because you couldn't, you know, I never, I don't trust this e-stuff. So um, you can file Federal Express. Make sure you get a receipt. You can go USPS, uh, USPS or Federal Express because both of them give you a receipt. USPS is cheaper. But do the I-131, follow instructions, pay them the check. It's always good to have a medical record or some reason that you need to check. There's three reasons for parole uh, under TPS. Number one is for work. So if your employer sends you over there. Number two is humanitarian. Someone is dying. My mother died or is dying, but died sometimes is hard because they say she died. Why do you want to go? I need to go to a funeral. Um, and the third one is, oops. But there are three reasons you can file for parole. It's all in the web. 
So I normally like to go on humanitarian because it's the broadest. Um, uh, I also have a lot of kids uh, who want to travel. So they'll like on a football program, on a soccer program, you can do that too. But I like to use humanitarian, it's just easier, you know? Um, so normally I like a medical letter from like a grandmother or mother, whoever relatives are auntie and uncle saying that they're sick. Another way to do it, have a pastor from like Mexico or El Salvador write a letter confirming this person is a member of my church. He's 81 years old. He's his ID. And um, he would like to invite you to come visit. But some something to show humanitarian. Because sometimes that would actually Trump started that. It used to be parole. It's very, very easy. But it's still easy. But you just need better reasons. Yeah. So this person says that uh, travels twice in 2016 and 2019 before. So does it count? Uh, good for adjustment through my wife? It depends or on how you came, you left and come back. So let's assume you came undocumented in 2016, you left in 2017, you come back undocumented in 2019, there's a perm bar, you cannot adjust through a citizen of your wife. But if you came as a student, like you came in uh, 2016 as a student, you left uh, for summer in 2017 and came back in 2019, it's, as long as the last entry is legal entry, you should be able to. But if the first entry is illegal, the second is not, then you need to leave, like, there's a 10-year bar stuff. But normally, as long as the it's just legal entry, yes, you can adjust for your wife who's a citizen now. The good news is if your wife is only a green card holder and you're still in status. So, for example, I came in 2019. As a student, I'm still in status. I paid, I'm taking 12 credit course of hours. Um, I just married a green card holder. You can also adjust now because it's, it's current under India or under any other country. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Wong. This person is just uh, sending more and more comments. So thank you so much for uh, getting in touch. Yes, you can adjust because you're TPS, but you never parole. Oh, you must have paroled under TPS because you got student, you got TPS, you love, you traveled in 2016, 2019. You must have traveled on parole. Yes, you can adjust now if your wife is a citizen. Even a green card, you could, as long as your student visa was never in status. Okay. Um, Ms. Wong, this question is uh, very, very interesting. Um, hi, I am from Pakistan. I am gay. I came 12 years Absolutely ago. Absolutely, you could file. And I don't mean to cut you off. Yes. Okay. The question mm -hmm. is, why didn't you do it within one year? Why did you miss your one year? Because And when did you come out as gay? Because if I didn't know I was gay till now, but you came 12 years ago, when did you find out you're gay? Because any time you file asylum, you miss your one year. The most you can win is withholding at that because the judges are very tough on that one year. And Taliban was in Pakistan forever. I mean, this ISIS stuff, you know, that's what I think. I could be wrong. But uh, the one year is important. Uh, maybe maybe this question is because of uh, what happened in um, Afghanistan that the Taliban took control of, of that country oh. and maybe they are more powerful now in the whole continent. We're always there. You know. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You are right. Okay, Ms. Wong, how long in advance or uh, what time of the year should we file the H-1B petition? February. So uh, once you get a job, you can get a job anytime before February, wait for February, uh, till sometime in March or April 1st, between April 1st and April 5th. If you got into the lottery, the 20000 for master's and PhD and, and 65000 for each uh, for bachelor's, then you can file the H-1B between... April 1st or April 5th, then the lottery comes in. So the best time to get a job. So on the other hand, if you get a, got a job with a not-for-profit, with a university or hospital, it's a rolling. You don't have to wait till February. So the best time to get the OPT or the STEM OPT expiring in May is the best time because by May, you already know if you got the H-1B, if you got it and it's approved, then you have a gap cap to work till October 1st. If you didn't get H-1B or no gap cap, now you make sure you're in status because your status expiring in May. So I always tell clients, if you have STEM OPT or OPT, make sure it expires sometime in May or June. Those are the best dates because you have free gap cap. That means you can work in America without the status from that May date to October 1st. Because whatever you do, it only comes in October 1st. 
Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Wong. Our time is up. So thank you for uh, each and everyone that uh, has sent questions. And we keep receiving them, but we're going to save some for next week. And Ms. Wong, so this is an awesome show today. A lot of participation from the audience and your answers have been really, really awesome. So thank you so much. See you next time. And is there any other uh, advice that you want to mention to our audience before we dismiss? I just want to congratulate you on your recording for tomorrow and your music and enjoy California. Thank you so much, Ms. Wong. I will try as much as I can. I'll get some rest uh, today and maybe in the afternoon I'll, I'll go outside. So thank you so much. And thanks to everyone working there on Cleveland, helping us, Heidi Murillo. She is helping behind the camera and Ms. Wong that is always answering your questions. Uh, please don't forget to call. The phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. The attorney Margaret W. Wong with over 45 years of experience. See you next time.